Hello, it's a really nice place to give a, a talk on software security. And uh, so let's go. A few words. Uh, does it work? Other thing? Not oh, this one? OK, no, sorry. No, this, one. this one. OK, yep. thank you. So uh, something about myself. So uh, I worked for two years of, as a director of information security and compliance for Acronis. Uh, previously, I was uh, working more in the cybersecurity world, doing uh, anti-malware protection and uh, also some just generic software development. And um, uh, so now I'm based in Singapore. And out of there, we have a distributed team of people working in, in Acronis uh, on, on security of our products and uh, other uh, security aspects of, uh, of the overall business. So, and today I want to talk about uh, how and why we should develop secure software, and actually uh, what each uh, of you as a developer, as a manager, could do in order to have more secure so software in the world. And, and, and by the way, the amazing thing is that we all is living in a world where software is everything. So originally it was like just a mainframes uh, and just normal computers. Now it's uh, Laptops, smartphones, cloud, IoT, everything. Everything is software. Uh, at the same time, the things are getting more and more complicated. So the complexity growing over time uh, you know, tremendously. More and more people involved into the development of the software. So that's why there could be definitely some problems and issues. And um, some question for you. Uh, so there are two things. First is the, what do you think? What is it? It's kind of old computer. Apollo computer, yeah, yeah, that's right. So, uh, and, and on the right, you have some uh, very nice vacuum cleaner. Uh, so, how do you think, uh, what, what was the size of the software in the Apollo computer? How much memory it has? So, what is the size of the code? Any ideas? Okay, kilobytes, megabytes, gigabytes? <laughs> kilobytes, yeah? Okay. Yeah, that was around 64 kilobytes of memory. Um, and now in the vacuum cleaner, you have a firmware of more than 10 megabytes. Of course, yeah, it's just an approximate numbers, but still, the amount of code we wrote every, every day, it's, it's tremendous. So, um, but why people actually talking about software uh, security? So what is it about for the, for the average person? So uh, I guess that uh, some of you may uh, remember some, some days when you have such images on your uh, Windows computer and saying, oh, crap, I need to reboot again, or I need to fix something. Um, it was the early 20s, so um, maybe not everyone were uh, working on the Windows at that time. But also, there are some other issues, like you don't have access to the website. You actually cannot be sure about the security or safety of your children with the new uh, devices, or even you cannot be sure about the safety of yourself. Um, or, for example, you cannot travel, or you cannot trust the transportation uh, system in the country. So that's, what about, that's why people are talking about software security. But then why industry, or all of us here, are actually talking about software security? Obviously, we're users, so we have the same problems. Maybe we are really geek people, and we would like to you know, uh, fight uh, security or you know, malware. But actually, there is something else, and uh, I believe that because of the security is not just a user problem, but a business problem nowadays, we actually can spend time, come to such nice conferences, uh, or actually work dedicated on, uh, spend our time uh, full time on security problems. Because business risks are really high, so it could be financial, reputation, litigation risk, and so on. So this is a, it's a really big shift, which um, actually, I think, uh, happened within a, a last one or two decades. So, and there is another way of uh, thinking about software security. It's actually the ecological risk for uh, IT industry for our community. And a good example of that is the recent Mirai botnet, which was just using uh, uh, different IoT devices, or uh, like here, uh, webcams, security cameras. And uh, that was not a problem of the developer of these cameras. That was a problem of all of us, because the, the DDoS attack, which were ha possible with these cameras, is actually uh, the, the record DDoS attacks uh, in, in the history. Yeah, and there is also a good uh, book by David Rice on the geekonomics or how the actual the software um, 
or irresponsive development of the software could you know, uh, make our life uh, worse or just bad. OK, so um, now moving to the thing is how actually with the industry is, is solving that problem. So what we can uh, introduce. And I want to talk about the secure SDLC. Who knows what is the SDLC? Self-defined local controller. Life cycle. Yes, software development life cycle. Great. So, um, and so back in 2000, early 2000, uh, we've seen a lot of different attacks or epidemics, actually. There were a number of, number of uh, network worms which actually hit thousands or hundreds of thousands of computers. Uh, and that was not a, a good time to, kind of to, li to, to, to live in the IT world, and I think especially in Microsoft. So um, even one of the uh, attacks, this, the, the blaster, I think, they actually were saying, like, Bill Gates, you know, go and figure out what's wrong with your software and, and fix it. It was actually the message to the, to the Bill Gates. And it's interesting to see that in that uh, exact time, or even before that, in, in January 2002, uh, Bill Gates wrote uh, an email to all of the employees of Microsoft saying that we now should focus on security of our software. It was a trustworthy computing initiative in Microsoft. And this initiative was moved into uh, kind of execution very quickly. Uh, yeah, by the way, he was uh, pr pr promoting the book now of one of the Microsoft uh, employees. It's, I think, about 400 or 600 pages. So he specifically said, guys, go and read that book, uh, because we cannot live in a world when our software is, is insecure. And then he <coughs> kind of approved that all the Windows developments around uh, 9,000 people. I don't know, what is the community of Bulgaria, software, software developers in Bulgaria? Is it kind of comparable numbers, I guess? So all of them just stopped working or stopped developing new code and, and spent two months uh, training and fixing uh, existing security bugs. So I think this is not what every company can afford, actually, uh, nowadays. So and then, closer to the end of 2003, there were the first versions of this formal software development lifecycle at Microsoft, which we're actually putting the security as a part of the software development process and not something which you can put on top of it. So, and, and you know, over time, there were multiple different frameworks, technologies, methodologies of how to implement uh, or add security into the software development. Uh, so the first one is uh, the Microsoft SDL, then the more kind of independent open SAM, framework and, and uh, more recent the same. So all of them are about specific practices of what should you do as a developer or as a software development company to actually uh, have less security problems in your software. Uh, I wanted to just say one thing. Yeah, go and uh, just read briefly what is it if you didn't uh, do that about the, these frameworks. The BSIM is specifically interesting because they are collecting practices which are used by real companies like 120 specific companies in the world, like Oracle, Microsoft, uh, and, and Google, all others. So what they actually do in their process to deliver secure software. And then they kind of they, they, they prioritize, they create some specific uh, kind of uh, benchmark tool for you, so you can understand where you are uh, in comparison to these companies. But <clears throat> The main feature of all these uh, approaches and methodologies is that you need to use the security as part of the overall process, not as a separate uh, approach which you can just put uh, on, on top of, the, of your software. And today I want to talk a bit, a bit more about the specific uh, part of the SDLC process. This is the overall uh, kind of hierarchy of practices uh, and uh, functions which is defined by the Open uh, SAM framework, and specifically about construction verification. So why about this? Uh, well, I think it's more related to the day-to-day -day work of the developer or QA engineer, so we're just focusing on that now. So talking about the construction, there are three things, the threat assessment or threat modeling, uh, security requirements, and secure architecture. 
So three practices. Let's start with um, threat modeling. So the threat modeling sometimes considered something boring, or which, well, why, why I need to do the threat modeling? Why not just go and uh, develop my uh, functionality? So actually, the threat modeling gives you, uh, through, I think, a quite funny exercise, uh, a very important answers. So you're trying to say and, and answer the question, like, what I'm actually building. OK, I'm taking this Jira task today and, and developing something, but it's very interesting to just stop for a moment and ask your product manager, why are you developing this? What, what this whole thing is supposed to do? So second thing, you should probably uh, take someone who is more or less familiar with security issues, potential problems, and try to generate ideas of what could go wrong, what are the key risks and problems, and then how to mitigate them, what are the potential uh, solutions, how to prevent, for example, an attacker to get access to my data, considering that we have these APIs or this platform and so on. And of course, you need to uh, kind of do it in a, in a regular way, always trying to understand what we're actually missing. Maybe the situation changed. And there is a great book on that uh, from 2014. I think it's uh, worth at least uh, you know, looking into that for, for all of you. So uh, there are a few different approaches, like formal, when you need to take a spreadsheet and, and just you know, fill in all your um, components of your software and list of the potential risks. It gives you very granular results, but it could be actually uh, you know, time consuming and sometimes, as I said, boring. So brainstorming, uh, is that what we're more kind of doing at Acronis, is we when we have a security team and we go together with developers and product management together before we, go, before we uh, develop something new and spend a couple of hours thinking, well, what is, the, what is this, uh, how it's different from what we were developing before? What are the extra risks we could see uh, in that uh, functionality? And now we, we came up with some <coughs> ideas of uh, what risks we have and how we to mitigate them. But always do not uh, underestimate your current uh, kind of threat landscape, and uh, your threat model could be incomplete all the time. So just you know, think about all the time, uh, maybe spend even formal kind of meetings on that on a you know, uh, regular quarterly basis. So uh, I wanted to talk a bit more, more about how uh, cloud applications. So we are, and Acronis is a, a cloud service provider. So that's why we're focusing on how to make our cloud applications secure. And I want just to share some thoughts of what should be important in a cloud environment. So, and, and how it's different from the on-premise classical approach. So first of all, the, the normal user who is just getting a trial in your cloud is, could be an adversary. So it could be a hacker who is trying to figure out how to uh, break your software. Or at the same time, your software, which if it's on the internet, is always on the radar of different people who are scanning the network and uh, trying to uh, hack things. So, and uh, it could be, um, well, it's a good sur big surprise if I don't know, some journalists will uh, call you and say, hey, I see your uh, IP address with uh, this SSH with uh, just a normal password authentication, uh, and I also store my data on the same, and I just kind of send my, my backup to the same uh, IP address. What's, what's the problem? Why? Uh, or you need to think that users are tend to use the same passwords in different services. So for example, if some website would be hacked, and some of the uh, passwords would leak, then these same people uh, could get probably into your service at the same time. Or for example, cloud intercommunication. So uh, if you rely on authentication with some other provider and that provider could be hacked, that means that people uh, who use that for authentication can get into your cloud service as well. <clears throat> so talking about the next practice, uh, which is the security requirements, the key thing here is that you have two piles of requirements. You have business requirements, and you need to understand like, what my user, what different types of users, uh, are supposed to do with, with the data, where they're supposed to have access uh, or where they don't need to have access at all. Or, or there may be some other compliance requirements which I need to uh, apply before designing my software. And another pile of the requirements is something specific which each developer can use. Uh, we call it uh, a baseline or application security uh, policy baseline, 
where you say specifically which uh, things you should use for cryptography, for authentication, how you test your API security, and so on. So uh, yeah, we have a specific uh, policy uh, in Anacronis. So all that is what each new engineer should go read and uh, ask questions if you don't understand why is it so. Security architecture, the next practice, is actually about that the tools and technologies you use is, is helping the, you to uh, improve security of the overall product. So I think it's quite a simple uh, principles, but it's hard to uh, kind of apply all of them to your kind of uh, architecture because, well, sometimes it's already defined or sometimes it's, it's really lots of kind of uh, discussions going on inside and, and not everything could be achieved at the same time. But still, you need to think about the, the deny by default. All access should be denied by default. Or your design should, be, uh, should survive, actually, if you will publish the architecture, the architecture tomorrow at some white paper, and the next day, your system will not be hacked just because you published the, the architecture of your system. So the least privilege, I think, is it's, it's easy. And the defense in depth. Don't think that you have some one layer of protection, like, OK, authenticate my user. That's it. I don't need to do anything else. Uh, or I have some kind of secure environment where my application works. It doesn't work, actually. So also, some cloud considerations. So um, I, yeah, as I said, the perimeter, uh, which could you know, uh, be present in some uh, in environment like enterprise is not available in, in the cloud. So such attacks for the web services uh, could actually easily allow attacker to query or to get access to the other components of your software in the cloud, and you need to uh, be ready for that. So the web um, application firewall is a good thing, but it will not help you uh, to protect all the components inside without adding more measures, more security measures. So such measures could be the uh, mandatory service to service authentication. So just uh, one service cannot go, or just unknown service cannot go and, and query something uh, inside your uh, internal, uh, internal uh, cloud. Or uh, each, uh, each component should know uh, what is the current mandatory access control list for him, so he can, access, he can answer requests from this service, but not from that service. And of course, it's better to split services by their criticality, by their uh, kind of risk, and, and try to think about how I will uh, well, deny access from that type of services to this type of services. Um, another aspect of the secure cloud architecture is you need to think that, well, it's a very much a kind of a chance that at some moment you will be compromised. So, you need to think about how you can slow down the attacker uh, and not allow the attacker to achieve its goal with just one step. So one of the examples could be that you could use some encryption on the database. So for example, if there is a SQL injection uh, kind of vulnerability, all the data will not be just easily uh, you know, grabbed and, and, and used because for it's encrypted and you need another service to, uh, to query another service to actually decrypt it and use it. And also introduce a, a number of monitoring tools which allow you to, for example, identify internal scans that some services, for some reason, trying to reach all of my IP addresses and, and send random uh, queries to them. So this is, should be on your radar. But you know, I was talking a lot about some well, con concept, uh, concepts, but don't kind of get me wrong. Don't use it you know, from the day one. If you're building something uh, which you know, the world built a million times, don't reinvent the wheel. Don't kind of build the uh, threat model for your tiny mobile application. Go and actually read some well-known uh, papers or uh, some manuals on how to do that for web applications, mobile applications, and start from there. Second part is the verification. So we were do doing the development. So now we need to verify that security of the software is uh, within our boundaries. So the first thing is the design review. OK, we know that um, the picture was developed. Now we want to put it in production. But before that, you need to uh, sit with uh, maybe with the security person within the team or with a, 
uh, external team and figure out if the threat model was actually considered when we developed this something new, or there were all the security requirements are, are met, or no compliance requirements uh, we, we are missing. So, and at Acronis, we uh, also did some checklists. Uh, and it's not the checklist to, to, to say if the design is OK or not. It's the checklist for the, prog for the product manager, for the person who actually tried to create a new uh, piece of functionality to figure out, OK, should I do a formal design review for, from the security standpoint for this uh, piece of functionality or not? And uh, this allows us to build in that to the, uh, our development process, like in Jira, person could say, OK, I need a formal design review for my epic so that uh, we as a security team will know that someone will come at some point to us and we will discuss this functionality. We can prepare for that. And we can actually measure our loads. We can plan our time. Uh, so this is the one of the examples how you need to uh, combine security practices into your so software development process. So implementation review. <coughs> Well, maybe something obvious like manual code review. Nobody actually likes it, I know, but sometimes you need the very highly skilled people on the, on the team. But for the critical parts, we may say that this functionality should be manually reviewed by some expert. This is normal. But of course, for the normal things, we need to use some tools for automation. So here are just a list of tools we uh, used or using or playing with. Uh, all of them are free so, free, so you are very welcome to also go check them out and maybe uh, use in your projects. That shouldn't be uh, something complex. So security testing practice, um, it's about manual security testing, like kind of penetration tester. It could be your internal person, or that could be an external company, uh, your contractor, to go and manually check the system in the runtime. So actually be able to, trying to, to, to crack it to, to uh, find vulnerabilities and problems, we, we actually do both of that practices. But at the same time, <coughs> that there are the things like bug bounty programs. I think uh, everybody is aware of what is it. Uh, it's actually automating uh, for you this process and uh, providing incentives for external researchers to find vulnerabilities in your software. A um, few, few words about that. So. Um, the good thing is that you're paying for the real result. And um, security researchers, they also get paid for specific finding. That's, that's kind of cool. Uh, there are also a huge community on some, on some of the platforms where you can find uh, people with specific skills or specifically motivated to work on your bug bounty program. Uh, types of the bug bounty program uh, are really different. It could be a private one. So uh, as an average person, I cannot go and submit a bug to that private program because I don't even see it. Or a public program where everybody can compete for that bounty. Uh, also, the scope is very important. You cannot say to just test all of our resources on the internet. You need to carefully explain what are you focusing, uh, what you don't care about, and also adjust your uh, payments depending on the uh, resource you're testing. And also important to provide some access, if we're talking about the cloud environments, some test access to uh, some of your systems. It could be uh, sometimes even production, a staging environment, or a beta environment. So it, for you, it's for you to decide uh, what is kind of suit your risk appetite and uh, your uh, requirements. Yeah, just uh, one thing. When we launched recently our private bug bounty program, we were kind of, well, unsure and a bit skeptical about the results. But we actually got a few really good findings just within a month from um, uh, one of the researchers, which we kind of thought that if they would uh, stay in our code for longer and we will not find them by ourselves, that could be a real, um, and if they will be you know, revealed by someone else, that would be a big, big problem for the company. So there are some real practical results from the bug bounty program in our experience. We will see how it goes over the next uh, year. But it's definitely worth to start it, and it's uh, not very, very complex project. project. So for the, the dynamic testing, uh, there are common tests, like there are, and, and there are common tools to test um, your software for the known 
web security, OWASP top 10 vulnerabilities, or just scan for open ports, or figure out if there is sensitive data leaked with uh, your APIs or in your logs. That's kind of cool. They're all of all of them are free as well, and you can yeah, go and play with or even write your own. And talking about writing your own tools, it's actually not something you can do for fun. I, I think you, do, you should do this uh, on purpose. Like, not every uh, well-known tool can specifically track one of the vulnerabilities you found before in the, in the new versions or in the new products of your company. So. Uh, your API security, your past uh, issues are known only by you, and you cannot use just standard tools without any customization to uh, use them. So we're also using uh, some tool uh, called Defect Dojo to orchestrate and provide some reporting and dashboards for uh, our team, so we can collect all the uh, a tool uh, results into one place and prioritize our work, create Jira tickets, and so on. It's also uh, uh, free, so go and maybe t test it, play with it. Quite useful. Yeah, but again, again, don't reinvent the wheel with the security ver verification. There are a number of verification guidelines which could be used by every average developer uh, or QA engineer, which you can take as an checklist of the step-by-step uh, recipe and perform some very basic but still sometimes very useful uh, testing of your mobile or web application. So don't start with, you know, from scratch. Use what community already provided to you. So key takeaways for all my talk. So first thing is that the security is not uh, kind of just a user risk, it's a business risk. So if you want to improve security in your organization, software development organization, just go and talk to the business. So you need some business support. Uh, and I think nowadays it's quite simple to explain the potential risk to the business if you don't invest into security. So start implementing your uh, secure SDLC, even, your, even if your team is small, like 10 people or I don't know, 15 people, still try to find a dedicated person who can start doing that as a part of the overall development. But don't do it kind of on a big picture, trying to do everything at once. Start with small steps and kind of give a very tangible result. OK, and now do um, a static scanning for my code on kind of a uh, regular basis. And I found already kind of three specific uh, bugs in our software. That's cool. OK, think, think about it and do this thing first before moving to other. And also invest into people. So uh, people is how we actually you know, deliver the results. So knowledge and motivation should be uh, available for people who want to do the security of the software. And the last thing kind of is everything else was not <laughs> interesting. Just know your technology. Because all of us as software engineers, we work with specific uh, platforms, specific technology stacks, specific type of the applications. There are a bunch of uh, different articles or materials or conferences on that topic, so know how these things work. And there are, I'm sure, uh, many interesting things you will learn about security of the tool which you're using. So thank you. That was nice to uh, explain you how we do it at Acronis and how you should you know, perform security in your companies. Thank you, Oleg. We have we have time for a short Q&A session, so any questions to Oleg? No. Everyone is secure, OK. <laughs> any questions? Anyone? OK. OK, Oleg, let me ask you one question from my side. So um, <clears throat> you saw many issues in uh, Acronis software and other type of software. Can you remind us maybe one specific example where uh, the issue was really uh, easy to prevent, but people just not to think about security from the beginning, and this is why we need to spend time after that to fix the security issue. Anything on top of your mind? Uh, yeah, I think it's probably something from the configuration standpoint, because at Acronis we not just uh, develop a software, we actually manage the full stack from the, from the hardware till the, the, till, till the UI. And uh, I think it's something when the person who is deploying a, a new version or who is just um, making a, a small change could mess something very simple. 
like, I don't know, some passwords. They could be, for some reason, or, okay, password was insecure, but it was supposed to be kind of switched off when it's moved to production, but, well, some developer you know, came on Monday and said, hmm, I think it was something I've seen in the code, like on Friday, maybe it's already in production. And yes, it could be in production. It's, it's very, very kind of scary sometimes. So uh, the most, I know, uh, the, the biggest problems could be from the simple mistakes, I think. Just That's pay attention to security. Yeah, right? pay attention to security on a very small scale. Okay, thank you very much, Alec. Thank okay. you. <clears throat>